So let's dig in a little bit. I'll give you some stuff if you're a note taker. It's not, out, it's not up on the screen, but uh, if you want to write them down just to get us our feet wet. I think most of us know what we mean by parables, um, but I think going a little bit deeper will help any of us no matter where we're at. Uh, the Greek word for parables is parable, P-A-R-A-B-O-L-E. And it translates to putting things side by side, which makes sense for our parables. Because they're very much like what we would call today metaphors, where he's taking something that's ordinary and something that's unexplanatory uh, to humankind and putting them side by side so we can understand them a little bit better. Uh, when it comes to the, this type of storytelling, it's, it's somewhat like allegory, uh, except for allegory is much longer than parables. Parables tend to be uh, just a, a paragraph, two paragraphs long. Uh, and it also um, is similar to the proverbs, but proverbs are usually a sentence or a bullet point long. So they're usually kind of short and to the point. Uh, also, parables usually are either setting you up for a question or they're answering a question. So when we're talking about the parables of Jesus, and because he's not the only one that used parables, other rabbis use parables to teach. Um, we're looking at things that are a couple blocks long that is trying to explain something that doesn't make sense to us normally. We went through uh, some examples of parables because sometimes they come in clusters. When, just see, it was Matthew 13, when we were talking about the, what it looks like to live the kingdom of God now, as aspect of Jesus, what he's teaching is about kingdom living now. Uh, if you remember, we went through Matthew 13, and he got on a kick where he put about five parables back to back to back, trying to get us to understand the kingdom of heaven. And you and I aren't made to understand the kingdom of heaven. But, uh, and, and I still believe that he was very excited when he was talk, talking about this and saying, you know, kingdom of God living now um, well, well, is like a great pearl. You, you, you're a jeweler and you've got all this jewelry collection and you find this pearl that's uh, of just great worth. So you go home and sell all the other jewelry just to get this one because that, that, that's the dream. That's, that's one. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's just it's worth surrendering everything else. So it's like if you're going through a field and there's a treasure that you find a hidden treasure that nobody else knows about it. So you cover it up, you go home, you sell everything you've got to buy that field because you need that treasure. You get so much more than what you sacrifice out. And he goes through several examples. That's a very, uh, sta very common thing for Jesus to do, try and explain to us what uh, the kingdom of God is. As a matter of fact, C.H. Uh, Dodd, if you guys want to look, like if you want to go much, much deeper, C.H. Dodd was a, uh, theolo a, theolo yeah, a theologian, there he goes, uh, he wrote a smaller book on parables in 1935. Uh, about two-thirds of it is on parables. And he's one of the first that we find that looks at parables very similar to how I do, or how we have been in these studies where the, the parables are trying to explain something that we as men, me as women are not prepared to understand. So that's why he's got to give us something commonplace to be able to give us something extraordinary. And oftentimes that those parable studies are on the kingdom of God. Uh, but there's also other things that they explain. They also explain God's character, which is outside of our realm, his work, the, the destiny of humanity, the last days, dangers of disobedience, uh, following the ways of being the subject of the kingdom of God. These are all things explored in the, the parables of Jesus. Now, I do want to be a little cautious as we go through it. We want to make sure that we're in context. We want to make sure we understand who the original listeners are. We want to make sure that we apply it to our lives properly because when you get to things that are metaphors, you can get like into la-la land on some of it. Um, for instance, for a metaphor, we go through different seasons. Here's the church. And uh, I will ask you to be praying over that. I think there's a new season being ushered in. Uh, there's a, a word that I've been playing with. I've asked Angie to stop praying over it. I'm going to talk to the elders about it in our, mo our next meeting. Um, I've got a three-day sabbatical coming up. I'm going to explore where oh, I think he's leading us next. But he has always led us in, like, in seasons. That, that seemed to last like a year or two years or whatever. And one time, this is going way back, uh, there was a season called Reboot. I was going to say, a couple people remember, it was a reboot. And it basically was a time where we had been a church, uh, we're coming up on 19th anniversary. Uh, I think we were a church like for four or five years at that point or something like that. And we had learned some lessons of how not to do things because, you know, we were stupid. And uh, the more you get in the Bible and more experience you get, you start learning some more things. And so the general vision was like having problems with a computer is let's kind of just shut everything down, stop trying to keep pushing forward, 
get into the world, bring things back up, let him bring things back up, and move forward without those bugs that we had in our, our, our system. That was the, the general feel of it. And I remember somebody, I don't remember exactly who, but like after we were talking about it for a while, they're like, yeah, but also when you reboot a computer, it does this, and it does this, and it does this. How does that apply to the season? Like, they, they, they don't. Like, the season's not supposed to match the metaphor. The met metaphor is to match the, the season just so you can understand better this. But sometimes we can make proverbs mean things that they, they're not, never supposed to mean. That's just not part of the, the metaphor. Um, if we were going to study the parables that John records, uh, we'd be done now. John does not record any parables. John just wasn't into it, I guess. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, give us over 40 parables. Uh, we will not be exploring all of them. The goal is to go through uh, the next five, six weeks, however the longest spirit has us in it, and um, look at how to study parables, look at some of the, the common threads so that you can continue into the other ones on your own study as well. Does that make sense? That's basically where we're at, and we are going to go through one particular parable, uh, or section of parable, uh, by going to Luke 14. So if you want to get your, at least I'm going to mess with you just a little bit. That's okay. Um, Luke 14, we're going to find Jesus at a particular place. Again, there's Bibles around the room and the baskets underneath the chairs if anybody needs one. Uh, we also have, uh, there's an app, it's a national app called YouVersion that's free to you. And if you uh, download YouVersion and do a search of local live events, you'll see TSF and today's date. That will give you the scriptures, place to take notes, prayer requests, whatever you want. So as you're getting there, I think we're close enough into it that, okay, I just want to give Tony time. I also, before I start reading, I want to show you a system, not the system, but a system when it comes to parables. So I'm going to go jump back on you there, Lisa. There you go. Characteristics of a parable. I do not know yet, because this is a new one for me, uh, if this will match up to every single parable that Jesus gave. However, at common glance, it matches up to a lot of the ones I can think of real quick. Uh, and so we're going to experiment with it as we go through different parables. But here's, here's what this particular system uh, throws out as a, as a possible characteristic of a parable. Uh, there's a familiar part. It's going to start with something that everybody that's listening gets. Uh, then it's going to introduce the unfamiliar. It's going to have something that just, they wouldn't even have thought of on their own accord, or we wouldn't have thought of on our own accord. Then it will go back to the familiar and apply the consequences, or apply, I think pi is apply, isn't it? Consequences of the point. There's usually an unexpected part, and then there's usually a question to consider, whether it's asked by Jesus or whether or not it's applied. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave that up as we go, go through the story. Actually, we can leave that up the rest of the sermon, and we'll uh, play with it a little bit as we go through the introduction and get our feet wet. So, here we are in chapter 14. Starting out in verse 1, um, we see that on one Sabbath, and we remember from multiple studies that we've done that that's usually there for a reason. That means that Jesus is about to tick somebody off um, because of how they see the law versus how the heart of God is. On one Sabbath, uh, Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler, the Pharisees. They were watching him carefully, and we're going to find that he was kind of watching the back. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, again, that's a Saturday, not a Sunday, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Okay, so our setting in the context that we have is the third time that Luke has told us that Jesus is having uh, a meal with Pharisees. Uh, there's one time, I think, uh, Luke 7, he had, had a meal with the Pharisee and those around him. Things went pretty well, bless you. Uh, Luke 11 is uh, the second one. Uh, he ends up announcing many woes over the Pharisees, W O E S. So that one did not go quite as comfortably. Uh, and then we have this one. Uh, tonight. And the main thing to understand, if we're going to look at the familiar, is what their familiar was, 
when it comes to meals instead of just ours. I think when we look at this, it's like, okay, he's in an uncomfortable place. He's sitting with these Pharisees, uh, religious leaders. We've seen this scene many times before. This is a guy with dropsy. He's picking up on some the previous confrontation on whether or not uh, it's okay to heal on the Sabbath, and he's trying to show them what the fulfillment of the law is. But for them, it was more than that. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit. There's a book. Uh, some of you guys like books. Uh, I don't. Uh, called The Challenge of Jesus' Parables. So if you wanted to write that down. This is going to be one of my resources, I think, as I'm going through this study. And it's a collection of multiple writings from multiple people on the parables of Jesus. Some of it at the beginning is stuff like that you would dig into in seminary that a lot of people would get bored with and doesn't really apply too much to your day-to-day life, uh, but still good. And then it goes through the parables as these different studies. And I, I'm going to... Like I said, I don't like reading a lot to you guys because people start to glaze over. Uh, but this, I think, explains better than I could come up with what it would be like for them when it comes to these mills. Uh, this is from a, a woman by the name of Sylvia uh, Keesmat, K-E-E-S-M-A-T-T. I don't know if she was born with that or married into it, but all right. So here's what she shares. She says, remember, to, well, it's an observation. Remember to whom Jesus is here talking to a leading respected Pharisee. Now, one thing we know about the Pharisees is that they were a group within the first century Judaism who attempted to bring holiness to Israel by keeping in their own lives the laws of purity, especially as they pertained to table fellowship, to eating together. Consequently, the presence of sinners or other unclean people at the table would threaten the very purity that the Pharisees were trying to maintain. Because so much... uh, depend on such a mill, that is, the purity and holiness of the nation itself. Such threats carried far more weight than a mere breach of etiquette. The very status and future of the nation, as they viewed it, was at stake. So, what are some of the rules of purity? Well, one in particular is relevant to this passage is in Leviticus 21, 16 through 20. For those who want to write that down, Leviticus 21, 16 through 20. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and say, no one of your offspring throughout all the generations who has a blemish may approach the, to offer the food of his God. For one, no one who has a blemish shall draw near. One who is blind or lame, one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or one who has a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a blemish in his eyes or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles. I got that last one. I don't feel like going up in here now. Anyways, <laughs> these are the ones who were not permitted to offer the Lord's food by fire. They were, however, permitted to eat of the food unless that they were also in a state of ritual and cleansiness. Another indication that stringent requirements for meals can be found in the manual discipline of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The participants in such a meal sat according to rank. Gentiles were excluded, as were all imperfect Jews. No one was allowed who was smitten in his flesh or paralyzed in his feet or hands or lame or blind or deaf or dumb or smitten in the flesh with with a visible blemish. It is not entirely clear under uh, whether the laws found in Leviticus 21 and the mayor discipline were applied to the Pharisees through the table fellowship. What is clear, however, is that the Pharisees' stringent requirements for meal, meal preparation and eating assured that most of their fellow Jews, especially those who were wanting in some way, would have been excluded from table fellowship with them. So again, to them, they were looking at it as if you mess up this mill, it can mess up the entire nation. They were pretty, pretty extreme on that. So then the question becomes this, how did a guy with dropsy show up? Right? I mean, these are the type of things when we're reading the scripture, it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't really make sense. How did a guy with dropsy show up at a table with the Pharisees? Probably the most leading, Deb's going to check to see if there's any green grass. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> uh, one of the, and this came up at the Michael Card conference this past year. Um, the leading theory that I have heard that I, I'm 100% on, but again, it's not the Bible, so you're not stuck with it, uh, is that during this time, oftentimes, and, I, and, uh, and this, this is true, um, the Pharisees, because of their purity and wanting to pure the nation through this and because they wanted to... Uh, I guess at some point somebody thought this was a good idea so that other people would see how good they are and they would want to be good too. 
their mills were not just mills like we would have a potluck here at the, at, at the fellowship. We would be in the middle with the mill, those who were invited, and then the halls were open so that anybody and everybody could walk by to see how awesome we are. <laughs> that, 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 it was they were learned by seeing how our position is and how we were perfect. And look, we're even hosting this Jesus guy they're talking about. That, that was a very common place thing to do. So now all of a sudden it makes sense that there's a guy with dropsy because there's people who are diseased or people that were spiritual and clean according to their, their rules and those type of things. And so in the middle of this, and this, this is really important for us to get the parable, Jesus is in that situation and completely breaks all the rules, not just on the Sabbath, by saying, so can you come over here for a second? Can you come into the, the, the middle with me? I, I, I want to take a minister to you. That's huge in this situation. After it's done, we get to verse 7. Now, now this is done, Jesus told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest somebody more distinguished than you uh, be invited by him. And he comes over to you and says, Give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may see, to say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he, humble, he who humbles himself will be exalted. Very similar to the voice that we go to in James all the time. He who humbles himself will be raised up. Now, one thing to notice here, the first parable has nothing to do with the guy with dropsy. The first parable takes it and focuses on the inner circle. He's not moved to the outer circle. He's, he's also noticed by watching them that they're all jockeying for the best place. And for some reason, I find this hilarious. I find this to be like an uncomfortable moment that you just kind of have to giggle to yourself if you're on Jesus' side. Just because, like, first off, like... Did a guy already sit down, like, in one of the top seats, and they asked him to move to the lower seats because he wasn't as honest as the guest? Like, what is he thinking in that moment? But it's kind of a, like, oh, is he talking about me thing? Or is it a, like, yeah, go get him type thing? I don't, I don't know. I just kind of wonder about that. And then I'm wondering, like, the guy that's sitting on, like, the third highest seat, like, what's he thinking? Like, uh, am I okay to sit here anymore? I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just like this weird thing that, that comes in that they got the familiar, but then he brings in this unfamiliar concept that humility is actually greater than honor. When, when it comes to King God, when it comes to seating, humility is greater than honor. And so I, I think that's that's hilarious. So anyways, so they got the familiar with the party that they're in. They got the unfamiliar where all of a sudden they're all uncomfortable because he brings it back to that familiar with the consequences that come at the point. Where am I sitting? What am, what's going on? What is my heart? Where's my place? Um, the unexpected is the part about the humility being raised up. That's completely foreign to their thought process. Uh, from a godly perspective. And so the question to consider, if you're there or if you're here well, listening to the parable, is how am I doing with my humility? Am I letting God lift me up? Or am I letting, you know, am I trying to do my thing? Am I trying to get further ahead at work? Am I trying to take and be the boss of my family? Like, like wh what is it by my means and what is by his means? Uh, I came up with a weird example of this that you might judge me on. <laughs> but... Um, What's that? Katie, were you talking again? <laughs> Just letting the moment pass. When, oh, this is horrible. When my grandson was born, I have two grandkids. Uh, my son was still living up here. He's in Florida now, and, um, and his wife, and... Um, I'm very much a family-oriented guy. And so they uh, called me, I think it was a Saturday morning, it was. And um, I'm like, just beam it down in the hospital, right? And then you, like, sit there for, like, 20 hours or whatever. Like, like I'm the one that has the right to complain about that. Uh, I just had to sit in the, the waiting room. They did the, she did the rest. But anyways, but as it, it, the day goes on, the, the 
waiting room grows because Ryan and Alexis both have extended families due to uh, marriages not working out. So uh, my, so he's got me, uh, my side of the family. He's got his biological mother, um, and her side of the family, um, and. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. The, uh, <laughs> I don't want to sound like bitter and mean. You know what I mean? I just, yeah. bitter's, oh, yeah. bitter's my, <laughs> bitter's fine. No, Kathy, stop it. <laughs> Temptest. Um, and then she has her mom and dad, um, his, so his dad's side of the family and mom's side of the family. And let's just say there's a great mixture of personalities uh, in this, this group. And so finally, the, uh, my, my my grandson was born, and um, you know everybody's jockeying to get in to be the first to hold the baby, and uh, kind of it, it got goofy from my perspective, a little goofy, and so I just kind of leaned up against the windowsill and just kind of let him go for like ten minutes or whatnot, and then um, her mom says, "Wait a minute, Tom, do you want to hold your grandson?" It's like, yeah, I'd like to do that, and so like they bring her over and present, you know, that thing. I'm just not the guy that wants to do all that other stuff. And, uh, but it was a great moment for someone else to kind of recognize you in the room, to be able to bring it over, this great honor. Um, my grandson, I, uh, was, I loved him immediately and also realized he had like these big black alien eyes. <laughs> if you ever see pictures, huh? Th is that normal? Because I really wondered. Uh, it was like these big black round alien eyes, but he's a good boy. He's a good boy. But it was just that kind, of, that kind of situation where you're not trying to make things happen, but just let, let God take care of things. That, that's what the, he's asking about. Are, are you willing to do that? Um, so then he continues his talk with him, not in a parable, and, and he says to the man who had invited him, uh, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you uh, will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And that's a very common phrase for them at the time, resurrection of the just is basically God's great banquet that, that, that everybody wants to, to be at. So again, not parable, not hiding anything, not overly contentious at this point, that they're not bumping heads or whatnot. He's just saying, hey, look, if you look at this, this table and you look at the people on the outside see how you start the transition the, the, this is not the better way this isn't the better way and so he responds I love verse 15 when one of those who reclined the table uh, with him heard these things he said to him blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God which is basically um, to me he's trying to kind of change the topic in a light way without anybody feeling uncomfortable it's kind of like a churchy type thing to say. It's like if I, I was like, like up here talking about something that might be hitting at home a few people and one of them say, well, thank God we all get to get heaven at the end. You know, it's just kind of like, let's just kind of brush that off type thing. So Jesus being Jesus sees another opportunity and tells a second parable. 16, Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. So we're staying in this familiar theme. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say that things have been uh, already to those who have been invited. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Okay, how many of you guys would ever buy a field without seeing it first? <laughs> Nobody, no one, but please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, I need to go examine them, same thing. You're not going to buy a bunch of oxen if you don't, don't examine them in the first place. Lame. Please have me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. <laughs> well, the funny thing is he's not, even, he's not getting married that day. Okay. <laughs> What's that? You know who we are? I think he's the one that we were talking about crushed testicle. No, that's, that's not good. That's not good. That's not good. We're bad. I don't think he was bad on that one, Thomas. Maybe I was. Anyways, but I, I, maybe I have a wife. She won't let me come. Okay. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, 
Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and there's still room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. So the familiar was still on this banquet theme. And my guess is that they have probably experienced some people have given them excuses for not coming. This, this is a familiar. I mean, just in, in ministry, there's always, there's excuses why people don't show up and there's reasons people don't show up. He's not talking about reasons. He's talking about the excuses of, of these people showing up. So this is probably somewhat of a familiar and maybe even tristan a little bit to the guy that was the host for the, those who did not come. But there's still the others that are jockeying um, for, for position here. And so we've got kind of a familiar situation, but it's completely turned itself on, on top of the head with the unfamiliar, with him, no one showing up. And keep in mind also, he sent out the invite some time ago. He only sent out the servant to say it was time to go. It, it was time now. So they had time to, anyways. Uh, so the unfamiliar comes into place that forget everybody in the inner circle. Let's go, we'll go into these guys. So all of a sudden, now we're back into the misfit end of things. I'm not looking for the papa. I'm not looking for the ones jockeying for position. The ones that you said they can't be here, the ones that you've taken the law too far with to say that they are excluded because they're not as good as you, those are the ones I want to send out into the streets and, and have them come. That, that's, that's, a compl- that, that's bewildering. He's now moving them in and these guys out. The guy that said, blessed are all those who are going to eat at the king's banquet, Jesus is essentially saying to him, you might not get a go. That, that's what I'm trying to get to. Because you're, you're, you're not following what my father wants you to do. So he's bringing these people in. And then when they fill the place up as much as they can with those who agree, go with it, they says, now go out and compel. Go out, and the word is make. Go out and make them come. And so now it kind of moves into this great commission aspect of things, of what we're supposed to be doing, of leading people to Jesus. Okay, so the first round, they weren't interested. Maybe they were the second. Maybe the third. Go compel them. Tell them your story. Tell them about how good the food is. Tell, tell them what, what it's like to be at this banquet, what it's like to be in this kind of community. Come and compel them to come. Did you notice he did not compel the original ones that gave the excuses? Because they weren't humble to be able to be lifted up. Do you see how the parables work? And what, what he's trying to... To, to say to them that the back to familiars, there's still space, um, and there's plenty of space for misfits. We've talked about that many times, and uh, that's who we are. Um, the un- unexpected was making them, the, uh, the misfits, not the original guests to come. And the question becomes for them, not only are you humble or not, but will you be part of my banquet of misfits or not? Are you ready for that change? Are you ready for, for that type of, um, of living? Uh, so... It really does kind of shake them up quite a bit, but it should shake us up quite a bit as well. I think it would be silly at best to not realize that this one night changed a lot of people's lives. One of the things about parables is you have to remember who the original listeners are. A lot of times when you're giving parables in public, there's all kinds of different listeners. What does that Pharisee now think? Do they accept what he's saying? They discard what he's saying. Because Pharisees and the religious leaders were a big part of having him knocked off because they didn't like what he was saying. That's what happens with rejection is we start taking the blame in the messenger instead of leaning in. Those on the outside of the room, how did it change their life? How, how many of you guys have seen Knights Tell? Okay, if, if you haven't, please become holy and go home and watch it today. It's, it's a good, good movie with Heath Ledger. Uh, and it's, it's a time where there's like jousting and the knights and that kind of It's a comedy, but it's uh, with, with the jousting and whatnot. And Heath Ledger plays a, uh, the good guy who's our hero of the movie. And he's not a knight, but he pretends to be a knight to be able to be in these things and whatnot. And he's got kind of like three or four other guys that, uh, that hang out with him. And one of them is, uh, what's that author's name? Salser. De- Jeffrey Chaucer. So he was a real guy, but they pretend like he, uh, th- this is him in his early days. And he becomes his uh, herald. That he goes out and he announces the, 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 the knight. And uh, he's like over the top 
and no one had ever seen him like him before, and uh, he's not like prim and proper like the rest. And so when he goes out, uh, there's like the royal people here that are like in a lean-to and have these nice chairs and stuff, and then everybody else is out in the sun and the bleachers and stuff. And like the first time he comes out, he's, he, he does what everybody else does. Uh, the king, queen, royal family, and then he turns and says, and everybody else not sitting on a cushion? And everybody's like, ah, they finally get recognized or whatnot. <laughs> that, that's kind of how I think this outside group might be. They're like, yes. You know, like the, the kind of like that yes mentality. That would change everything. I've never heard that from a, a religious leader before. And the guy with dropsy that's now healed? Tell me he didn't talk about that till the day he died. The question is whether or not we make it through lunch without forgetting that we think about these principles in our own lives. Are you going to be at my banquet of misfits? Are you willing to be humble so that I can lift you up? There are concepts they never would have understood unless if you put it in the familiar forest and then shook things up a little bit. That's what the pills do.